What you're seeing is a war in the North Caucasus region on southern Russia. What you're also seeing is a war which is broken out simultaneously in the border between Pakistan and India. The forces behind these attacks on Russia and on India are the same. They are a mercenary force which was first set into motion by policies adopted at a trilateral commission meeting in Kyoto, Japan in 1975. The policies originally of Brzezinski and his number two man there, Samuel P. Huntington. The policies which were continued by then uh, trilateral commission member, that is back in 1975, George Bush, before he became vice president. These are policies which were continued by George Bush as vice president. This is under Bush, this was became known as the Iran-Contra drug finance link operations of mercenaries deployed with private funding all over the world, recruited from Islamic and other countries, and targeting Russia's flank. This mercenary force created then still exists the primary responsibility for creating the force was the government of the United Kingdom. Most notably, most emphatically, the government of Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. A policy which has been accelerated and continued in full madness by the present Prime Minister, Tony Blair of the United Kingdom. This war, if continued, using mercenaries, can lead to nuclear general war. The major powers principally threatened today by this mercenary operation are two of the world's largest nations, China and India. China on its western borders, India on its northern borders. Of course, Iran is also threatened, but more notably, Russia. If these nations are pushed to the wall, by a continuing escalation of a war, which is modeled on the wars which the British ran against Russia, China, and so forth during the 19th century and early 20th century. This will lead to the point that Russia has to make the decision to accept disintegration of Russia as a nation, or to resort to the means it has to exact terrible penalties on those who are attacking it going closer and closer to the source, the forces behind the mercenaries, which includes, of course, Turkey, which is a prime NATO asset being used as a cover for much of this mercenary operation in the North Caucasus and in Central Asia. This is our danger. The weapons the Russians have are no longer the large armies, the capabilities we thought of under the old Orgokov plan of the 1980s. Those vast armies are dissipated, weakened. Russia is ruined almost by a vast economic destruction caused by IMF policies and related policies. But Russia still has an arsenal, an arsenal of advanced weapons and laboratories which can match the weaponry, most advanced weaponry, being developed in the United States, Israel, Britain, and elsewhere. If Russia is pushed to the wall, where it decides to disintegrate willfully or fight back, the likely thing is it will fight back. It will use the weapons it has. 
It does not have the weapons to win a war, but it has the weapons sufficient to impose a powerful, deadly deterrent on the nations behind the mercenary forces which are presently attacking it. There lies the danger. Unfortunately, most people in the United States are living under the delusion that with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the combined military power of the United States and its British Commonwealth allies, including Australia, New Zealand, and so forth, countries that are really under the British Queen personally, as the United Kingdom is, believe that these forces, Anglo-American forces, are so powerful that they can ignore the United Nations Security Council and conduct wars on their own with impunity. Most Americans tend to believe that and believe they don't have to worry about foreign wars. They don't have to worry about terrible things happening in Africa or South America or Eurasia generally. It won't come here, just as many Americans said before Pearl Harbor about the war then ongoing in Europe. In reality, it can come here. I'm not predicting that it will. I'm saying the likelihood, the danger exists. And as long as the present policies of our government continue, especially the policies of the right-wing Stone Age faction inside the Congress, the right-wing policies of Vice President Al Gore and of Madeleine Albright, a Kis Brzezinski associate, as long as these policies on, on the United States part continue, the danger of war is growing. It's not immediate, not tomorrow, not the day after tomorrow. But wars come on like that. You get to a point of no return, there's still no war. Then somewhere down the line, maybe a couple of years later, the war actually breaks out. And war is breaking out all over the world now. Not only in the Balkans, as we saw recently, not only in an insane bombing attack on Sudan for no reason whatsoever. The in continued war against Iraq now the crazy intervention in Timor, which can lead to chaos in that region of the world. War is breaking out in small wars all over the world. If that process continues under present conditions, we are headed in the direction of something terrible, possibly even a nuclear war. Americans have to wake up and realize that the problem well, let's think back to New York in the old days. We once had a man who sold merchandise cheaply with radio ads. He called himself Crazy Eddie, and he used to say, my policies are insane. Um, Crazy Eddie, his policies and way of thinking apparently has been picked up by Al Gore and some people in the Defense Department and elsewhere in the United States. We've got to get the Crazy Eddie policies out of the United States government, as I shall indicate. These are the problems we face are deadly ones, but they're problems which can be solved. Wars, world wars especially, tend to come on in a certain way. It's been that way during this century. It was that way with World War I. It was that way with World War II. World War I began with the assassination of U.S. President McKinley, which resulted in a fundamental change in policy under Presidents Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson were allies, in effect, of the British monarchy, in the British monarchy's plan for a war against Germany under Edward VII, a war which actually broke out in 1914. The war was obvious, it was coming, it was clear from 1905 on. It was associated with a series of international, financial, and related economic crises. In the United States, for example, where we had the famous 1907 crisis, 1905-1907 crisis, the Russian War, Japanese War of 1905, the Balkan Wars, they kept coming and coming, and then suddenly there was World War I. Then there was World War II. World War II was essentially set into place when the chief, former chief, 
of the Bank of England, Montague Norman, together with other British influences and with support from the Morgan and Harriman banking interests in New York, put Hitler into power in Germany in January 1933. Once Hitler was consolidated in power with the death of Hindenburg in 1934, then the march toward World War II became inevitable. One of the conditions which made this connection was the fact that the world had gone into a great post Versailles worldwide depression, which broke out officially with the U.S. stock market collapse in 1929 which became consolidated with the 1931 collapse of the British pound sterling. And under these conditions, processes unleashed led to war, 1939, and led to war involving the United States on December 7th, 1941. Similar conditions now. The world has been, especially since a foolish decision by President Nixon in 1971, when he destroyed the existing world monetary system and set into motion a new so-called floating exchange rate monetary system, the present IMF system, the world has been sliding downhill overall. Though many people are deleave, deceived by lying propaganda to believe that there's prosperity in the United States, there is no prosperity in the United States except for the upper 20% of income brackets. They have more money, more cash. The 80% of the population does not. Where years ago, before 1971, one job in the family, or one plus jobs in the family, would be sufficient to support a family. Say someone in Pittsburgh, steel worker, 35 to 40, support a family with two children, maybe more. You could own a house, feel secure in the neighborhood, think about sending those children or assisting them into college. That's not possible anymore. It takes two or three or four incomes in the same family not to achieve that kind of standard of living in physical terms. For 80% of the US population, things are becoming worse. We're losing our industries. Our foreign trade is collapsed. Our, our net current balance, the United States, is in a disaster the order of magnitude of a $200 billion a year deficit or more, $25 billion a month in foreign trade losses or more, as a result of the NAFTA and related kinds of policies. We have been going down, downhill. Presently, at the present time, the European economy is collapsing. What's happening in the British rail system, the terrible accident which has recently happened, is typical of the breakdown in England as a result of policies of people like Thatcher. The same thing is happening on the European continent. Same thing is happening through most of the world. Japan is ready to blow up. Its financial system ready to blow out. And if it blows out, much of the world's financial system will go down. Ecuador is now declared bankrupt. Brazil is virtually bankrupt. Argentina is virtually destroyed. Colombia is controlled by armed gangs. It's like something out of the 30 years war in Europe, a nation being destroyed by armed bandits and the State Department expressing its sympathy with these bandits against the legitimate constitutional government of Colombia. Africa is a lost cause. Mass murder encouraged by our State Department. These are the realities. It is in this condition, as this present financial system approaches collapse, that the danger of war begins to emerge. This the current danger of war came to the surface beginning August of 1998. What happened? Well, the previous November, October, November, there had been a major financial collapse which had been bailed out with hyperinflationary growth in asset values. That is, the central banks began printing money, in effect, and pumping money into financial markets, stock markets and other financial markets. Hmm? So that had led into a, a new situation by the summer of 1998. The blowout occurred. It started with the Russian 
bonds, Russian bond debt. In August of that year, at the same time that President Clinton was being distracted by being called to testify before the special prosecutor, Russia declared bankruptcy, state bankruptcy. As a reaction to this effect, Al Gore and others, behind the back of the president, pushed through fraudulently a bombing attack on a pharmaceutical plant in Sudan. I believe now the president knows that was fraudulent, but nothing has been done effectively to correct it. That was the beginning. While the president was under attack in the, in the Congress by the first the House of Representatives, Republicans, and then in the Senate. Gore led the attack, which got us finally into a new war against Iraq. This occurred in the November-December period of last year. From that point on, we moved toward a Balkan war, where the British government, with the complicity of Madeleine Albright, the Secretary of State, got us into a Balkan war. It's not needed to go into the reasons how that happened or why it happened, but it was done. This led, as people in NATO and elsewhere said and understood at the time, the launching of the U.S. participation with NATO in bombing attacks on Yugoslavia were intended for the primary purpose of destroying the Balkans, not of dealing with the problem there, destroying the Balkans, and opening the way to NATO-related military adventures in the Middle East, in Transcaucasia, and in Central Asia. That was openly stated before the actual war against Yugoslavia was started. That was the purpose for the Balkan War. So these things are all interconnected. The primary crisis now is this. The present international financial system is about to disintegrate. I can't tell you, no one else can tell you exactly what day, week, or month that will occur. It is ongoing. The crisis is systemic. Every leading banking circle in the world knows the system is doomed and finished. People behind the scenes are taking steps to protect as much as possible their personal, precious interests, their personal interests. And meanwhile, the fools who are fooled by the propaganda, continue to rush into buying into stock markets and other financial investments. These are the suckers who will be totally bankrupted and ruined when the crash occurs. This is the situation. No one can prevent this system from collapsing. It will disintegrate. There are over $300 trillion worth, in US dollar equivalent, of short-term financial obligations of the form of financial derivatives hanging out there. Against this, the real assets to support this 300 trillion plus debt bubble, financial bubble, is not more than $41 trillion a year in GDP, uh, as calculated in dollars among all the nations of the world. Therefore, you have a system which is intrinsically, systemically bankrupt. It cannot be saved. The only thing that can be done is action by governments to put the bankrupt financial system and the bankrupted monetary system into government-supervised financial reorganization. In other words, to apply the thinking of a Franklin Roosevelt to the current emergency situation. This creates a crisis, a crisis in which powerful financial interests are totally panic-stricken, are driven mad by the fact that the system in which their investments are located is about to be liquidated. That the nation state which they thought they were eliminating with globalization is the only institution which can save nations from total destruction. It is under these conditions that plans to move toward military adventures, even wars, even general wars, and that risk of nuclear war is pushed by madmen, some in the United States, some in the Congress who don't even know what they're doing, as well as in Britain and elsewhere. This is the situation.
Now let's talk about me. I said that, as many of you know, or who studied history, that the onset of major wars or similar kinds of catastrophes and conflicts are usually have something to do with economic financial problems. They, and when financial crises are in the process of occurring of major economic conflicts, these are the times of conflict in which wars, which are otherwise possible, tend to become probable. So let's look at things from that standpoint and let's look at my concern, which has been my concern over for over 40 years. And look at it, look at this situation through my eyes. Back in 1959-1960, on the basis of a study I did of trends in the U.S. and world economy, it became apparent to me that if the policy trends, which had developed especially during the 1950s, the policy trends leading into the 1957-58 financial crisis, the so-called 1957-58 recession, that if these policies were continued, then somewhere along the line, probably by the middle of the 1960s, during the second half of the 1960s, you would have a series of international monetary crises, which would tend to lead toward a breakdown of the existing monetary system. In my view, this represented the greatest long-term danger to civilization and to the United States. My concern was to change those policies. Then we had President Kennedy. Kennedy was probably the brightest president we've had since Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, that is. And he did a number of things which tried to put the United States back on a positive course in the economy and in some other matters. Then he was assassinated. Then Johnson, in a difficult situation, capitulated to the Wall Street crowd, including people typified by John J. McCloy and his friends, and U.S. policy began to move in a poor direction. Even though Johnson was not exactly a hero on civil rights, he did the right thing on that and a few other things. He's got to be given credit for that. But the general trend of policy, especially from 1966-67, including the Vietnam War policy, was a piece of insanity. This led to Nixon's shutting down the existing monetary system in the middle of August 1971. Under these circumstances, beginning the middle of the 1960s, I began to be concerned that we were headed for the worst crisis of the United States and European civilization so far. My view was not a short-term view, but a long-term view. But my view was that we had to start to work now to begin to produce the shift in policies away from these policies, which, if continued, could lead to all hell breaking loose, as the fellow said. That came true. In 1971, I was probably the only economist speaking on the issue, which accurately forecast not only what happened in 71 with Nixon's decision, but what the results would have been. Since 1971, the general trend in U.S. economic situation and policy has been exactly what I feared. And during this period, I've warned against this, I've fought against this, I've attempted to influence against this, and I've tried to develop the contrary policies, the alternative policies, which would be an alternative to the mistakes that Nixon had made, the mistakes, the terrible mistakes that Carter had made under trilateral commission influence, things of that sort. And then the terrible mistakes that were made in the uh, Reagan administration under the influence of George Bush and his crowd in particular. Now, in this process, one of the notable things I did, beginning 1977, 
was to try to find a way of addressing what I saw as an increasing danger in U.S.-Soviet relations. It was my view that the confidence that the SALT I agreement, the ABM Treaty of 1972 and so forth, that these things were misleaders. They promised peace, but they were actually leading toward conflict, a conflict which could break out in wars and certainly could lead to general economic and political chaos throughout the planet. And thus, I looked at the, in this context at the question of weapon systems. It was my view that the weapons policy of the United States, the so-called detente policy of John J. McCloy, and also of Bertrand Russell, who was the real author of this policy, and of George Bundy and Henry Kissinger and others, that these policies were a fundamental mistake, a fundamental misunderstanding of reality. That we had to look at the question of the Soviet Union and our relations with it from the standpoint of trying to find a way to deal with this other than through arms control. It was my view that the arms control policy would come to a point of breakdown, that the condition of the Soviet economy would bring the Soviet economy to the point that it either would have the choice of breaking out in a military way or collapsing. That was my fear. So at that point, I worked on this policy in my run for the Democratic nomination for president in 1979, 1980. I featured this proposal for a new approach for dealing with the Soviet Union on the question of nuclear arsenals and related questions. Then Reagan became president. And I found myself in a situation of conducting a back-channel discussion in the interests of the United States with Soviet officials. It was all transparent. It was done with the supervision in most of this period by the National Security Council, which was to whom I was responsible for reporting on this. And it was done openly with the Soviet government representatives. What I propose is what became known as the Strategic Defense Initiative. It was actually President Reagan and his people who so named it. But the policy which he enunciated on March 23rd, 1983, was the policy which I had proposed be discussed between the United States and the Soviet government in my back channel discussions. And I had so reported the details of these proposals and discussions to the National Security Council and thus to the president. I call upon the scientific community in our country, those who gave us nuclear weapons, to turn their great talents now to the cause of mankind and world peace, to give us the means of rendering these nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. Now, as you know, that was turned down. And what became known as SDI after I was pushed out of the situation, 83, 84, became sort of pretty much a farce. Teller was thinking in the right direction. As a matter of fact, we shared views on many of these questions, not directly, but in our public statements during this period. But Teller was sort of pushed into the background, and the Heritage Foundation and the Bush crowd and the Republican National Committee crowd took over. And while President Reagan, as we know, up through 86, through his meeting with, at Reykjavik with Gorbachev, continued to support the policy and propose it to the Soviet Union, it was effectively killed and turned into what has become, in effect, a farce, even though some benefits of what we proposed are in the laboratories and places like that today. Now, under these conditions, come the year 1988. In 1983, I had told the Soviet government that if the president were to propose what the president later called STI, as he did on March 23rd to the Soviet government publicly, and if the Soviet government, then under Andropov, were to reject the president's offer, the result would be that the long-term economic problems of the Soviet economy would catch up with the Soviet economy and would lead within about five years to a collapse of the Soviet economic system. And that was my proposal. That I stated not only to my Soviet contact in these discussions, in 
19, February 1983, I stated it later publicly. Now my concern was how do I salvage a situation in which the Soviets were on a course of either war or breakup? How do I address that situation? Knowing it's very dangerous either way. So in October of 1988, October 12th, Columbus Day in particular, while a candidate for the presidency of the United States, I went to Berlin and I presented an address openly before television cameras there, which was later reproduced and put on national television in the United States, on network television. And in just a moment, you'll see part of that address here. In point of fact, when the breakup of the East Germany occurred, and when people from the West got into East Germany to see what the war preparations had been on the East German side, that my concern that the Soviets were on the verge of launching a military adventure into Western Europe were confirmed. The plans existed, the capabilities existed. The Soviet Union was at, at that point was on the verge of either going to war or not going to war, just as I feared. What I propose, as you see in the, in the tape from that broadcast in 1988, I was right. The Soviet system was on the verge of breakup, but it did occur six years later, not five years later. So who's counting? It happened. What I propose as an alternative, that the United States should then, at that point, propose a new policy toward Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, which I proposed in that broadcast, that this proposal of such a policy by the United States, especially by its president, should be the basis for dealing with the radically new situation which would be caused by the imminent then imminent breakup of the Warsaw Pact Soviet system. Under the proper conditions, many today will agree that the time has come for early steps toward the reunification of Germany, with the obvious prospect that Berlin might resume its role as the nation's capital. For the United States, as for Germans and Europe generally, the question is, Will this reunification process be brought about by assimilating the Federal Republic into the East Bloc's economy or economic range of influence, or can it be accomplished in a different way? In other words, is a united Germany to come into being as a part of Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals, as President de Gaulle proposed, or as Mr. Gorbachev has desired a Europe from the Urals to the Atlantic. I shall propose the following concrete perspectives to our next government. We say to Moscow, we will help you. We shall act to extinguish established food for peace agreements among the international community with the included goal that neither the people of the Soviet Union nor the developing nations shall go hungry. In response to our good faith in doing that for you, let us do something which will set an example of what can be done to help solve the economic crisis throughout the Soviet bloc generally. Let us say that the United States and Western Europe will cooperate to accomplish the successful rebuilding of the economy of Poland. There will be no interference with the political system of government in Poland but only a kind of Marshall Plan aid to rebuild Poland's industry and agriculture. If Germany agrees to this, let a process aimed at the reunification of Germany's economies begin, and let this process leading toward reunification be the punctum salience for Western cooperation in assisting the rebuilding of the economy of Poland. We in the United States and Germany should say to the Soviet bloc, 
Let us show you what we can do for the peoples of Eastern Europe. By this test in Poland, which costs you really nothing, let you discover and judge by the results whether this is a lesson you wish to try in other cases. Now, what does this mean today? I was right. What happened? Well, there were others who agreed with me. For example, there was a speech, the leading banker in Germany, Alfred Herrhausen, the chief of Deutsche Bank, was on his way to New York to deliver an address. I have later seen a draft of that address that he was to deliver. What Herrhausen proposed was what I had proposed in German terms, but essentially the same policy. What happened? Herrhausen was killed. He was assassinated in a high-level assassination done by military-grade assassins, not some stupid little terrorist organization. That was a cover story. The badham meinhof gang at that point no longer existed, the one that was blamed for the assassination. Rovetter, another German official, in the process of reorganizing what had been East Germany, had policies which moved in the same direction as Herr Herrhausen. Rovetter was assassinated. The policies of Europe moved in a new direction, under the direction of Margaret Thatcher, George Bush, and François Mitterrand, and with the consent, of course, of Gorbachev. I proposed, using the breakup of the conflict between the Western alliance and the Soviet system, using that as the opportunity to make a fundamental shift in economic and therefore political relations, to participate, to open the doors to rebuilding the shattered part of the world. And at the same time, as I had proposed to the Soviets in 1982-83 in the back channel discussion, to participate with the United States in developing systems which we could develop, which would enable us to eliminate the danger of an all-out nuclear ballistic missile attack, and to use the technologies which we would develop to that purpose in order to create a driver of the same type that we had with our aerospace driver with the moon, uh, man-moon uh, man landing of Kennedy. Many of you are shocked. Some of you are saying, why is this old geezer talking about a permanent colony on Mars 39 years from now with the major budget problems in Washington today? In a nationwide television broadcast a few weeks ago, I told you that on my first day as president, I should declare a national economic emergency and launch the largest economic recovery program in our history. During each of the first two years of my administration, about $2 trillion in low-cost federal loans will be invested in building up our nation's presently rotting industrial infrastructure, plus building up about 5 million new industrial jobs during the first three or four years of my administration. Looking back to the experience of the 1940-1943 period under President Franklin Roosevelt, we know that the recovery will creak at the beginning, but will build up speed over the first two years so that about the third year, the United States will have the highest per capita income in our history. There are no mysterious tricks involved. It is all basic economics modeled upon our successful economic recoveries under Franklin Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy. To use that kind of policy, a science driver policy, to accelerate economic growth and technological progress, and productivity and employment and quality of employment in the United States, in Europe, and also to use the obsolescence-ridden industries of Poland, of Czechoslovakia, of Hungary, of Russia itself, the Soviet Union itself, to use the technological capabilities they had 
despite their ruined, bankrupt industries, for massive infrastructure building throughout Eurasia, and on the foundations of that to build a, a general economic growth throughout this planet as a whole, in which we would participate with our former adversaries of the Warsaw Pact system in helping to develop countries in Asia which sought development, countries in Africa which desperately needed development, countries in South America, Central America, which desperately needed a reversal of the present trends in their policy. That was my policy. That was the policy thinking of some people. It was not the policy thinking of Bush. It was not the policy making of the US government under Bush. It was not the policy of Mitterrand. Hmm? It was certainly not the policy of Thatcher. Thatcher's policy, as was stated by her administration, was specifically an anti-Germany policy. The Thatcher government, supported by Mitterrand, said we must not allow the reunification of Germany to re lead to German economic revival, nor must we allow Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, the Balkans, to come under the influence of a general economic growth pattern from which Germany, as a technology exporter, might benefit. In order to prevent this from happening, Bush and Thatcher, under Thatcher's direction, launched the war against Iraq. It was a bait and switch policy. Bush had been the guy, key guy, who pushed for Iraq to conduct a war against Iran. Bush had been the key guy who had pushed Iraq on many of these policies. Bush and the Bush administration was the guy that gave the go sign to Saddam Hussein to take whatever action he thought fit against Kuwait's stealing of Iraq's oil. Then Bush switched under orders from Thatcher, and we had Desert Storm, which ruined much of Europe. After Desert Storm, we went immediately into the Balkan Wars, in which the British, the British government and the French government supported Milosevic as their asset against Croatia, against Bosnia-Herzegovina, and so forth. This, this was done as a part of the stop the Fourth Reich policy, that is prevent Germany from coming back as a major economic power again in Europe. That was their policy. Obviously, directly opposite to my policy. My policy was that the United States policy should be to recognize that Germany is the major machine tool driver part of the entire Western European economy. It is German machine tool exports, which are the basis for the, not only the German economy, but it is the German prosperity based on Germany's machine tool exports, which are the pivot upon which the entirety of the economy of Western continental Europe depended then and depends still to this day. It is the shutdown of the German machine tool industry sector and similar effects on France, on, on other countries, the low countries in Italy and of Eastern Europe, which has caused the economic crisis which is now besieging the Schroeder government of Germany and threatens the security and stability of all Europe. The same thing is affecting Japan in a different way. All right, now what is wrong? What is the policy? What is the issue? How does this affect war? Yeah. Let's go back to 1823. After the defeat of Napoleon, and after the British puppet, the Duke of Wellington's puppet, the Bourbon Restoration was restored in France, the British, together with Metternich, controlled all of Europe. The British and Metternich, the Holy Alliance, were the enemies of the United States, the declared enemies. However, the British always have two policies. Never try to find out what British policy is. They always have two, which seem directly opposite. They're for you, and they're against you. They're, they're buttering up your waistcoat while they're putting a knife in your back. Neither of which is either good is good for you, either cosmetically or otherwise. So the British policy was, yes, they would use the Holy Alliance 
as an ally in destroying the influence of the American Revolution, the influence the American Revolution had had on Europe. To eliminate American influence in Europe, which is what Metternich said repeatedly, what the British said repeatedly. But then the British, Jeremy Bentham, the head of the Foreign Office from 1782 on, and his canning, the Foreign Minister, went to the United States to a president who was not a fool, President James Monroe, and proposed that since the Holy Alliance powers, Metternich's group of Spain, Portugal, France, Austro-Hungary, were trying to grab off and recolonize South and Central America, that the British should make a treaty with the little United States, and the little United States should agree with the British to keep these filthy continentals out of South and Central America. This was proposed treaty by Canning with the United States. At that point, one of the protégés of, uh, of Franklin, former protégé, John Quincy Adams, was Secretary of State under Monroe. And Quincy Adams wrote this letter to his President Monroe, in which he said, the United States must reject Canning's treaty. We have, the United States, no community of principle with the British monarchy. We can make no treaty alliance with any power with which we share no community of principle. We shall not degrade the United States into becoming an American cockboat in the wake of a British man of war in the Caribbean or South America. And what he qualified as the alternative, we in the United States must keep our distance from this, we must state our policy clearly, and we must wait for such a time as when we have sufficient power to kick the British as well as the Holy Alliance powers out of Central and South America, in which we can protect the aspirations of the emerging new republics of Central and South America. That is our policy. Now this policy, called a community of principle policy, had been implicitly the policy of the United States leadership during the period of the American Revolution, and had been the policy of the United States under all patriotic presidents, such as Monroe, Abraham Lincoln, Garfield, Secretary of State Blaine, and a murdered President McKinley. It had been the policy orientation revived by Franklin Roosevelt. It was a policy orientation revived in part by President John Kennedy. Community of principle. What is the fundamental interest of the United States? What is our self-interest? What is our strategic self-interest? What has it begun from the beginning? What is it today? Our interest is to bring into being, on this planet, a hegemonic community of perfectly sovereign nation-state republics, which share that commitment to defense of the general welfare, which is the cornerstone of our federal constitution that with these nations, which must each be perfectly sovereign, we want no empire, we want no hegemony, we want alliances of the sort which occur only between nation states which agree that the idea of a community of perfectly sovereign nation states is the fundamental interest of each and all. That was the direction of Roosevelt's intended post-war policy, which Truman scrapped. But that was the policy. That is my policy. What is the fundamental interest of the United States? Is it to find somebody we call an enemy the way the British do? And go out and say, let's prepare for war against this chosen designated enemy? Shall we go out and pick out official enemies of the United States and stage wars with them? Simply to have somebody to shoot at? Or someone to hate? Is that our policy? Or rather, is it not our interest? that today as before, that the nations of South and Central America in particular be perfectly, absolutely sovereign nation states, not subject to any foreign supranational or other foreign authority, including the IMF, 
meddling in their internal affairs. They must be sovereign, as we desire to be sovereign, in fighting for our independence, establishing our Constitution. It is our interest to protect and to promote that sovereignty among these states, which Roosevelt called his good neighbor policy. That's our interest. It is our policy to establish the same kind of relationship with nations in Africa. They should develop. They should benefit. We should cooperate with them. We should protect and defend their sovereignty. We should free them from the legacies of former colonial and imperial powers, whether it's financial powers or it's military occupation. We should aspire for the same thing in Eurasia, both in our friends in Western Europe and also throughout the rest of Eurasia. What we should aspire to is that Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Iran, Malaysia, Indonesia, Burma, or Myanmar today, Cambodia, Vietnam, Japan, should all have the right to have perfectly sovereign, independently sovereign nation-state republics. Based on the principle of the general welfare, that is the welfare of all of the people, not only for present generations, but future generations, to protect their rights in the way Europe understood that the rights of each man and woman made in the image of the creator of this universe. That human beings are special. Every human being is special. And every human being's right to be special, in that sense, must be protected and nurtured and fostered by an agency which is more powerful than any individual, an agency which has the capability of defending that interest. That should be our policy. How should the United States conduct its foreign policy with a nation which is a potential adversary or simply an unfriendly nation? Under the principles of community of principle, let's take a step back and define this. The precedent for this kind of diplomacy was consolidated in Europe in 1648, 1650. In the context of the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia, that for a period from about 1517 to 1648, the period of approaching 150 years, Europe had been ruined by a persistence of religious warfare. Not as bad in effect, perhaps, as the Dark Age, which came out of the 100 years of the Wealth League policies uh, during the 13th and 14th century, but nonetheless, a virtual new Dark Age. The center of this was called the Thirty Years' War, from 1618 to 1648, centered in Germany, but also in adjoining countries. At the end of this process, peace was brought through the influence of people like Cardinal Mazarin in the form of the Treaty of Westphalia. These nations had the wisdom to agree that unlike the crazy Versailles Treaty, which is a completely immoral travesty anyway, that we were not going to try to find the blame for each party for guilt in connection with these wars and the atrocities which are perpetrated as part of these wars. No seeking of retribution. The principle of no retribution was key to securing the peace. People realized that the, to try to fight out the issues of recrimination and respective guilt for this offense and that offense would mean the war would just go on. It could not be stopped. So they said, no recriminations, no retribution, no war guilt, no war blame. We start from scratch and we build an order which is designed to bring peace. Now, as a result of that, Treaty of Westphalia. In the agreement to this principle, we had the emergence of a policy 
not a perfect policy, but the emergence of policies which included what became the policies of the United States, what became essentially the policy of community of principle as expressed by Secretary of State John Quincy Adams. So when we have adversaries in the world, we don't go around trying to punish people. We don't go into countries and spank them because we don't like their internal conduct. You don't do that. Only idiots or warmongers do that. It's not allowed. Don't try to legislate morals at the point of a bayonet of invading or occupying troops. That leads to the worst result. And when people say, well, it's a terrible crime, we've been morally offended, we've got to go in there and straighten these people out. All you're doing is you're spreading war. war you're spreading war that cannot be stopped. Because now the people who are going in to do the punishing are the new criminals. And hatred of those criminals will result in people taking reprisal against them. And when they take reprisals, then the people who are the victims of their taking reprisals will become angry and they will kill too. So the solution to war, as has always been understood by the great strategists of modern European civilization, and also China, is to bring peace. Now you do not bring peace by provoking war, which is what NATO did in the Balkans, which is what the Aust British government, the British monarchy did through Australia in the case of Timor. They provoked war. And now they're moralizing about how horrible it is to see the war which they intentionally provoked. Madeleine Albright, under the direction of Robin Cook, the, one of the same authors of the intervention into East Timor, was the clown who turned a problem which had been soluble in Kosovo into a horror show where her war her and Robin Cook's and Tony Blair's war caused the atrocities, set off the atrocities which people began to complain about earlier. Oh, maybe there were atrocities beforehand, but that could have been dealt with. She and Blair and Robin Cook acted in concert to make solutions impossible. Vice President Gore also acted to try to prevent a solution to that problem short of war, which could have been had and the world would have been better off if that had been done. So what do you do when you're dealing with the former Soviet Union? What do you do when you're dealing with any nation in the world? If you're the United States, and understand the United States, its interests and traditions, you go to the other country and you try to find, as the Treaty of Westphalia did, you try to find a way of building peace, not seeking conflict. How do you build peace? Well, certain principles. Do we agree that a sovereign nation state is a fundamental human right established by modern European civilization? So the first human right we must agree upon is the sovereignty of the other nation state. If we can agree on that, we've got to start. If we agree that the purpose of treaty relations is to find beneficial, mutually beneficial effects do we want to promote trade? Do we want to promote the benefits of trade? Do we want to see other nations more secure, more internally secure, with happier people, less likely to get angry and start doing terrible things? So we do that. And that's the policy. That's always been my policy. All right, we have a terrible problem. Here we are in the United States. Patriots of the United States are committed to defend the United States against what is admittedly a terrifying Soviet military capability. On the other hand, you have the Soviet Union, which is in a financial economic crisis and which faces a terrible military capability on our side, on the NATO side, on the Atlantic Alliance side. What do you do? You say, let's cut this nonsense out. Let's find a new way. Let's stop talking about we want to fight for this, we want to fight for that, we want to fight against this. Let's stop that nonsense. Let's say, what is it that we really need? Can't we find a way to cooperate and build peace and build security and build cooperation? Can't we go to others and say, isn't common justice 
so much in the interest of us all? Haven't we learned our lesson? Isn't it time that we cooperate? Isn't it time that we build a system which is consistent with the interests of, of us all, as they tried to do in the di very difficult negotiations which established the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648? That's, the pol that's what the policy must be. Now, why should anyone turn down, as the fellow says in New York, Orchard Street or elsewhere in former times, how could you turn down such a good deal? Why would anyone turn down such a good deal? Well, let's look at it. What's been the problem? What was our, what was our problem with the British? Why do we have wars with the British? The British were trying to destroy us all along. If you read their literature, from the time of the accession of Georg Ludwig, who became known as George I, the first king of, the, of Great Britain, of the British throne, there's been a constant conflict between the people of the Americas and the British monarchy. The British monarchy has always been based, in this, since that period, has always been based on a financier oligarchy modeled upon the financier oligarchy of ancient Venice and Venice itself. That is, the power lies in a ruling class. The ruling class of Britain today is not a hereditary landed aristocracy, though some of the wealthy people there may own some land and may have hereditary aristocratic backgrounds. The power in England lies with a group of financiers who are centered around the Bank of England and whose tentacles extend throughout the British Commonwealth and beyond. This is the real financial olig oligarchy that controls Britain. They are, against, they are against the idea of the modern nation state. Their view is financier power, just like Alan Greenspan. Their view of financier power is that the United States should exist only for the benefit of the British and Wall Street financier crowd. As you see, when it comes to HMOs, for example, in the United States, the financiers of Wall Street who are taking over the medical insurance business what are they doing? They are looting the patients. They are looting the insured, denying them a medical care, accelerating the, the morbidity rate, the death rates, among patients in order to make more profit for those interests, Wall Street centered interests, which have taken over the medical field, insurance field, and related field. They want to steal Social Security in the same way. So what's the conflict? What's, what's the issue here? What is the conflict between the United States and the British monarchy? Which, as I shall indicate, is key to understanding the problem today. What's the conflict between the American Constitution and Wall Street? As typified by the case of the HMO crisis, where you have people in the Congress who in effect are owned by Wall Street, who are determined to prevent anybody from giving a patient the right to sue a company which, whose actions increase the risk of morbidity of that patient, or that is, deny the patient the care which a doctor would have them have. What's the issue here? Roosevelt described this often during his term as president, especially during the 1930s. From the beginning, Roosevelt had a quarrel with the Supreme Court. And Roosevelt was right, and the Supreme Court was wrong. Perhaps his attempt to pack the Supreme Court, as it was called at the time, was a tactical misjudgment. But nonetheless, the, his motive for proposing it was perfectly justified. If you look at the history of the United States, the history of our struggle for independence, and look at some of the documents on which our republic was founded, and the intent of the authors of this republic, such as Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. And you find in the Declaration of Independence a passage, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. That phrase there was something which the founders of the Constitution, uh, 
the Constitution, actually of the Declaration of Independence in this case, adopted from Leibniz, from Gottfried Leibniz, who was one of the great influences in England and on the United States during this period. The correlative of this life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which was what the United States adopted in opposition to Locke's notion of life, liberty, and property, which is the British conception, is reflected in the U.S. Constitution in what is called the General Welfare Clause. The responsibility of government to promote the general welfare, both for ourselves and our posterity. Now, this is the this phrase in the U.S. Federal Constitution's preamble is the fundamental foundation of law for our constitutional law as a whole and defines the character of our republic in the most simple, principled way. That before the modern nation state came into existence, the idea of a state was is it was owned by somebody, owned by an emperor, for example, or owned by a ruling oligarchy, or owned by a ruling race, which held the other race in subjugation. So therefore, the state, the authority of the state, and the interest of the state lay in that interest which corresponded to the property interest owning the state. This was changed in Europe, beginning with the accession of Louis owns Louis XI of France, in founding the first effort at a modern sovereign nation state. Under this new conception, which was sometimes translated into English language usage as the idea of a commonwealth, this meant that the authority of the state and its responsibility lay entirely in the unique capability of the sovereign state to protect and promote the welfare of each and all of its individual members as the first chapter of Genesis defines each individual human beings as a part, set apart from animals, as each woman, each man, all made equally in the image of the creator of the universe and endowed with the power to rule within the universe over all other things. Therefore, the responsibility of the state is to protect and promote that interest which is identified in that definition of the human individuality. The state must not only defend that for living people, that is, democracy is not enough, because the living must not deprive the future generations of their rights either. The state's responsibility is to protect the general welfare not only of the living and all of the living, but also to protect their posterity, their future generations. That's the, nation of the nation, nature of the nation state. And our constitution, our fight for independence meant that, exactly as Abraham Lincoln summed the same thing up in his famous short Gettysburg Address of 1863. That is, that is the American principle. The British have a different view. Maybe many people in the British Isles, including the Irish and the Scotch, may have different ideas. But maybe many Englishmen have different ideas. But nonetheless, the British system and Wall Street, which is sort of a cheap imitation or not so cheap imitation of the British system, have a different idea. And that was Roosevelt's quarrel with the Supreme Court and with Wall Street. Roosevelt defended the notion of the obligation of the U.S. government to promote, defend and promote the general welfare for ourselves and our posterity. And that was the core of his quarrel with Wall Street and with the Supreme Court. Most of the important constitutional fights he had were on that issue. That's our principle. It is our principle that a community of principle means that other nations which have the same idea, 
The same principle of the obligations and authorities of government, of sovereign government, under the notion of general welfare, that these nations represent, together with us, a community of principle, a natural community of principle interest. And therefore, we should treat them as brothers and sisters, as equals, and recognize that defending one another and defending that interest that each of us has together is our common interest. Our purpose as a nation has been from the beginning, as John Quincy Adams expressed this in say, talking of the future in respect to the implications of what became known as the Monroe Tree Doctrine. If we can't defend the rights now, we must commit ourselves to come to the position where we will be able to defend them in the future. Our fundamental interest as a republic is to bring forth on this planet the hegemony of a community of sovereign nation states, each of which has in common its commitment to the general welfare of its total population and their posterity. That's our, we, otherwise it is not our intent to meddle in the internal affairs of these countries. It is sufficient for us that they are sincerely and seriously dedicated to promote the general welfare as we understand the notion of the general welfare. And they understand that we as nations must stand together against those forces of oligarchy, such as the British financial oligarchy, which are our natural enemy. Now, what happens then? How does this financial crisis lead then to the danger of a general war at this time? My concern has been, as it's recently expressed, and I've done consistently what I did in the case of the negotiations of 1982-83 leading into the proposal for the SDI. The same thing. I have proposed, as I proposed in the October 12, 1988 address in Berlin, I have proposed that the United States support continental Europe in particular, or those nations of continental Europe in particular, which agreed with this. Hopefully Germany would play a keystone role in this. And that through our relations with Germany and other countries in Western Europe, that we would develop a, a new way in our relations with Eastern Europe, with the states of the Warsaw Pact, with the former Soviet Union. And we have proposed, especially since 1989, when this situation broke up, that this be extended as a Eurasian project to include the nations of China and India, Iran, Pakistan, other countries of Asia, a population which includes the majority of the human race. And that we agree, hopefully, and the government of China has demonstrated its, and the state have demonstrated their interest in having this kind of relationship with the United States and with Germany and with India and with Russia. Not a question of alliances against other nations, but trying to build a community of principle based on the idea of promoting the general welfare, not meddling in each other's internal affairs, but bringing ourselves together about a common principle, the same principle which Roosevelt intended should be ruling in the post-war world, and probably would have been if he had not died prematurely when he did to bring these nations together as a community, not as an alliance, but as a community of principle. And to do what? Well, we're in an economic crisis. The system doesn't work. The present financial system doesn't work. It is bankrupt. It is unsalvageable. So what do we do with it? Well, we use the power of, gov power of government, of sovereign government, which according to our law and our notion is the most powerful temporal authority on this planet. We use the power of government and concerts of governments to put this sick system into bankruptcy reorganization and establish a new international monetary system, new set of financial and trade relations and economic relations in order to ensure that the citizens of the United States and of Western Europe and of China and of India and so forth do not go into a dark age of misery simply because the financial system and monetary system has collapsed 
because their money is no good, because the banks in which they deposited it don't exist, the insurance companies which insured them no longer exist, and there's nobody to pay the bills, and they're out of a job, and they're on the streets roaming like people in the 13th century, 14th century, out in the streets dying, roaming because there's no state to intervene. So if we as a nation, and other nations agree, we can, under these conditions of crisis, where everybody's aware that we're faced with that kind of danger at that time, when the blow strikes, so to speak, governments, including a group of governments led by the United States, including the President of the United States, Bill Clinton right now, meet with other governments, put the system into bankruptcy, and agree on setting up a new monetary system, a new financial system, a bankruptcy arrangement, and getting the world economy moving again immediately so people don't start dying en masse as a result of the collapse of a financial and monetary system. That's the purpose. Now, what happens then is this. This kind of a crisis is a crisis of what? It's a crisis of a failure of a bankrupt evil system. The bankrupt evil system is what is represented by the floating exchange rate monetary system with all the horrible things it's done to the United States people and other people of other countries over these years. When you come to the point that that system is bankrupt, then the system as a whole is vulnerable. And maybe the people will intervene through their institutions of government to change the system. What system would we change back to? Very simply, we would change back more or less immediately because that's the only system we could get agreement to, to what Franklin Roosevelt had intended would happen at the end of World War II, if he had lived to see that time, is to set up a, a, a group of nation states, set up a new Bretton Woods system, operating very much in the same way the old Bretton Woods system did, same kind of principles, but under the conditions of reorganizing the world in bankruptcy, as we had to on a large scale in Europe, for example, at the end of World War II. It's a natural tendency, if nations are left to themselves and their senses, to make rational decisions based on the lessons of past experience. But what does that mean? That means that powerful forces who have been looting the world, such as those gangsters who've been looting Russia, under arrangements set up by Thatcher, Mitterrand, Bush and company. These people lose. The British financial oligarchy loses. The financier oligarchy of Wall Street loses. Of Europe loses. The people take charge. And whenever that is threatened, something like that is threatened, as in the past, then under such conditions, the oligarchy, the kind of forces which were the enemy of a republic from the beginning and are really the enemies of humanity today, are prepared to unleash terrible effects upon the people to prevent the people from taking control of the system away from them. That's what the conflict is all about. <sighs> Now, Russia, as you shall hear in a moment, has been deliberately, willfully ruined and looted. It is not Russian gangsters coming out of Moscow who have put their money in banks in New York and elsewhere. It is American gangsters put into power by the British and by George Bush back in 1991 when he appointed Bob Strauss as U.S. ambassador to Moscow who have hired Russians, retained Russians, to loot Russia. And they take part of the proceeds, which they pocket as commission for stealing from Russia and other countries, and they deposit it in various banks, like the, the British monarchy's Antigua Bank. Antigua is totally under the British crown, British monarchy, and more people speak Russian in the business there than any other language. Why do they speak Russian? Because they're Russian gangsters who keep their money there and deploy their money through there. 
So the gangsters which we hear about in the United States, the Russian gangsters, are British and American controlled gangsters. They are thieves for the US mafia. So these forces have looted Russia. And these are the forces these guys want to play with. So we've come to the point that the Russian system is collapsing. The Russian people have a choice of taking back their country, getting rid of that, this gangster process, constituting government again to meet the demands of the general welfare of Russia and its posterity, of cooperating with nations such as China, India, and other countries, Iran, other countries, Western Europe, other countries, to promote the general welfare and the sovereignty of nation states. And that, that, the authors of globalization, which is a code word for oligarchy, don't like. And in order to attempt to prevent that, as it became clear to them over the period 1997, November 1997, especially from the summer of 1998 on, it became clear to them that we were headed for a situation in which the President of the United States, even timidly in New York in September of 1998, could speak about possible revisions of the existing financial and monetary system. What did they do to Clinton then? He had essentially no problem. The whole problem against him was essentially cleaned up, under control. But under the threat in October that Clinton might finally act like the President of the United States and act to bring about a reorganization of the international monetary and financial system, they acted. They moved an effort through the House of Representatives to accelerate an impeachment proceeding against the President. This destabilized the government considerably, and it hasn't quit since, even though the Senate proceedings did not result in impeachment, the president has not really been fully himself since that time. He was badly damaged in his effectiveness as president by having to go through this mess. And the nation was damaged by this silly, corrupt proceeding as well. So it, up to this point, the United States government has failed repeatedly to take any effective initiative to prepare for what has now become inevitable, a general collapse of the present world financial system sometime soon. As I said, no one can predict the exact day because it can happen on any day. Any number of events exist there, ticking out there, bombs ticking out there, any one of which could set the collapse off or they could be postponed because the tick doesn't blow up for weeks or maybe a couple of months. I, time is running out. The, system, the crisis systemic is finished. Still, the president has done nothing. The, work, the situation in the Congress becomes worse. Congress's attitude on the issues of Russia, relations with Russia, with China, economy, and other things become worse and worse by the day. As this, people have the myth that with Gore going down, or Gore advancing rapidly backwards, which I think is a fair way to describe the progress of this campaign, there's a general suspicion that maybe George W. Bush or some other ventriloquist dummy might become the Republican president. And therefore, these fellows, these are in like sharks in a feeding frenzy, feeling that they can get their insane policies through. The other part about this, which makes it even worse, as I've indicated, is that those who are in bed with Blair, effectively, or with London and Thatcher, on these kinds of policies are incompetent. And some of the better qualified military experts in Britain, for example, would agree on that. They're incompetent. Essentially, the, uh, the present uh, uh, Secretary of Defense is incompetent. He's a playboy. He's not serious about the serious strategic thinker. He's an errand boy, a playboy, more concerned with other things than understanding the situation. In general, what I see coming out of government is, in terms of strategic policy is utter incompetence. It's amateurism. 
this play about the uh, ballistic missile defense, what I hear is amateurism. Yes, there are people doing studies of serious weapon systems, not of the type you hear talked about in the Congress. That's amateur night. That's idiots, babbling nonsense. There's no reality to it. There are new types of weapon systems which go beyond what people think nuclear weapon systems do. The idea that kinetic weapon systems are the ultimate is nonsense. They are not. Kinetic system, weapon systems have essentially been implicitly, scientifically outdated in principle since the middle of the 1960s. New technologies exist, which continue to be developed, which go beyond anything most people know about. For example, one thing is better known, which I helped to make well known, and Edward Teller helped to make well known back in the 80s. Electromagnetic pulse effects, a few properly designed weapons exploding over parts of Europe and the United States would effectively blow out virtually every personal computer and every piece of equipment which depends upon that kind of electronic circuitry. Just blow it out. Telephone systems would go out of existence. Automobiles that depend upon these kinds of systems wouldn't function. The whole economy would collapse simply because of the vulnerability of the present economy of Western Europe and the United States, for example, to attack by sophisticated modern electromagnetic pulse system weapons. Those exist. They can be delivered. They're real. There are other systems called special effects weapon systems, which are being developed in laboratories, I'm sure in the United States, Russia, and elsewhere. These go way beyond the, with the scope of simple electromagnetic pulse uh, system weapons. They are capable of, of so-called tactical, that is of non-strategic military use, but with strategic effects. They're being prepared for use. So these guys in the Congress and elsewhere who are talking about ABM and talking about this don't know what they're talking about. They are utter incompetence. They're madmen. They're babblers. They're ideologues. They're not serious thinkers. The worst thing is at the same time, because we've destroyed industry. If you compare the level of management of top industry in the United States and Western Europe today with the levels of top management in the 1960s and 1970s, what we have today is a bunch of total incompetence. This is not accidental. What we've done, we've eliminated the emphasis upon high-tech technological progress, capital-intensive, machine-tool-intensive progress. We've eliminated whole categories of industries. We rely on outsourcing. We rely upon a, a piece of cookery called benchmarking, which is extremely dangerous for your product, shall we say, and maybe your health. So we don't have managers who are selected and trained to be competent. That our whole system, because of the collapse of our educational system, over the past 30 years, because of the collapse of our e economy, that we have incompetence has taken over in many places in government where we used to have competent people, in, in industry. And this, here we are, we have madmen with a glint in their eye. We have power, they say. A glint in an eye, let's charge up San Juan Hill another time. It was good the last time. Let's do it again. They don't know what the devil they're doing. And they're up against people who they're making desperate, who are developing such systems, who know about them, and who will push to the wall. My best guess will use them. And in the meantime, if we do not do what the Al Gores and the others are trying to prevent, if we do not revise the world financial monetary system the way I proposed, in an emergency reorganization, this world will disintegrate anyway into a prolonged dark age. So I don't know if you're going to survive. I hope you do. I'm doing the utmost to try to convince you that you must support me and others who are trying to do this. If you don't, your chances are, as they say, zilch. But anyway, look at what was done to Russia. To understand the willfulness 
and incompetence of the policy which George Bush, Margaret Thatcher, François Mitterrand, and others imposed on Russia in 1991 on, and what was, has been continued under the present Congress and the present administration. Absolute insanity driving Russia, a proud and potentially very angry nation, which still has powerful weapons and weapons capability, driving them up against the wall, driving China up against the wall, trying to drive India up against the wall, driving Iran up against the wall, destroying the Balkans, not conquering something in the Balkans, destroying it, destroying the whole Balkan economy, sinking the underbelly of Europe, trying to des destroy Africa, again with the blessing of the State Department with under Madeleine Albright. This is what is being done. So take a look at it, and I'll get back to you. When the Berlin Wall came down in November 1989, and when the end of the Soviet system was in sight, the Russian people, after suffering 70 years under communism, had hoped for a better future. Just think of Russia's huge scientific and technological capabilities, which for many decades had been restricted to the military sector, but which now could have been turned into an engine of economic growth for all Eurasia. But at the end of the 1990s, these hopes had been destroyed. Russia's economy underwent a process of disintegration which uh, sometimes had been described as Africanization. Russia has become a colony of the IMF, dependent on exporting raw materials, while its domestic production of finished goods has essentially been shut down. At the end of the 1990s, Russia's foreign debt has tripled most of its former state-owned companies have been handed over to organized crime and living standards of the Russian people have collapsed. However, contrary to the uh, mythology uh, spread by mass media, the destruction of the Russian economy was not some accident caused by corruption or by stupid reformers and their foreign masters who simply didn't know what they were doing. Rather, this was a deliberate policy of destruction, ordered by Margaret Thatcher, by George Bush, and late Mitterrand, exactly to eliminate the potential of, uh, for economic development which Russia uh, <clears throat> represented after the end of communism. The other objective of the destructive policies were the looting of Russia. Throughout the 1990s, uh, a total of about $400 billion of wealth had been transferred out of Russia. And by the assistance of well-known offshore centers in the West, this money was then uh, helped to feed speculative bubbles at international financial markets. Actually, the shutdown of the Russian economy and thereby also the reduction of uh, consumption of materials was a necessary precondition for maximizing the criminal profit from this process of looting. The destruction of the Russian economy had been orchestrated step by step by uh, <clears throat> on-the-ground officers of the International Monetary Fund. There had been several hundred of very detailed instructions by the IMF. Actually, in 1996, when uh, some of these very detailed instructions were leaked to the Russian media, Russian dailies raised the obvious question, why Russia under these circumstances do need to maintain a presidency, a cabinet, and the parliament. 
Now, the first step of uh, so-called shock therapy in 1992 was the uh, sudden liberalization of prices. This took place under circumstances where most of the production was still in the hand of either public or private monopolies. The sudden liberalization of prices, of course, set into motion a hyperinflationary spiral. And the government helped by increasing its energy prices by 400%. As a consequence, the savings of the people were eliminated, trade was being transferred to the black market, and domestic demand was collapsing, and therefore, as a consequence, also production in Russia was sharply going down. And exactly those industrial sectors which should have created the greatest potential advantage for the modernization of the Russian economy suffered the steepest decline in production. Machine building output fell to 32% of the 1989 level. Light industry even crashed to 11%. The production of crude steel fell from almost 80 million tons in 1991 to slightly above 40 million tons last year. However, because most of the remaining steel production is now being exported, the consumption of finished steel in Russia has collapsed to one quarter of what it has been in 1992. The sudden liberalization of prices had been accompanied by so-called privatization, which actually had been nothing else but the biggest plundering of wealth by organized crime in the history of mankind. Companies were sold at an extremely cheap price. Academician Lysichkin uh, had published a report uh, <clears throat> documented that after two years of privatization, 60,000 Russian companies had been owned by organized crime. And while the overall value of these companies, uh, based on uh, a comparison with uh, Western companies would have been in the range of one trillion dollars. However, the total amount of uh, sales uh, only reached the amount of seven billion dollars. That is less than one percent of the real value. Edward Ludwig of the Georgetown Center was so happy about this role of organized crime in the privatization of Russia that he even promised to honor organized crime with the Nobel Prize for Economics. So, in any reconstruction, the biggest effort, of course, is to have investments into infrastructure and to get capital investments in industry started. So we can raise the question, has, have there been investments started after shock therapy? And the answer, of course, is absolutely no. In the years 1992 to 1994, capital investments in Russian industry almost ceased to exist. And machine building was among the worst affected industrial sectors, with capital investments even going down by 92%. The collapse of capital investments in other sectors amounted to 96% in light industry, 94% in the construction sector, 95% in agriculture, 86 in chemistry, and 79% in transport and communication. In the years 1991 to 1996, about 60% of all Russian industrial companies did not have any capital investments whatsoever. Now look at science expenditures. Russia once had one of the best scientific cadres in the world, and of course this would have been a vital resource for any reconstruction process. But already during 1991, Russian science expenditures collapsed by one third. In 1992, they were again cut in half. By 1998, they have been well below one-fifth of the 1989 level. But this still is only half of the ugly truth. 
With skyrocketing prices for electricity, taxes, rents, and so on, are taken into account, the real money that R&D facilities could spend on their scientific work has fallen to 5% of what it has been in 1989. Wages for scientists had been cut even much more than average wages for Russian workers. In 1992, there still had been 5 million Russian scientists working at R&D facilities. But three years later, only 1.1 million had left. About 100,000 Russian scientists, scientists had left the country, but a much bigger uh, amount of scientists had simply been transferred from science into simple retail or administrative jobs in order to make their living. Now let's look at transport. The total amount of freight transport in Russia throughout the 1990s has collapsed to one third. While railways are still the most important transport system for the Russian industry, the railway transport volume as measured in ton kilometers has fallen to 40% of the 1988 level. Passenger transport volume of Russian railways in 98 was only half of the 1988 level. On more than one quarter of Russia's 80,000 kilometer long railway nets, speed limits now have, to be, have been imposed because of overaged railway infrastructure. Now, in early 1995, the IMF suddenly decided that hyperinflation now has achieved its intended goals. Sudden tightening of monetary policy was implemented. So far, the central bank had feeded the hyperinflationary process by printing money to buy up state debt. Now the set to stop and the financing of state debt had been restricted to the issuance of government bonds, in particular short-term GKO bonds, which soon were to become world famous. As part of this process of monetary tightening, the government cut its credit lines to uh, Russia's industry. Russia, Russia's economy turned into a non-money economy. And exactly at this moment, the volume of tax debt of Russia's industrial companies exploded. In June 1996, the amount of tax debt reached the equivalent of $75 billion. All domestic liquidity in the Russian economy was now being channeled into the build-up of the GKO pyramid. However, as all the available liquidity had been absorbed, even promised GKO yields of 40% and more were no longer sufficient to keep the pyramid scheme going. Already in 1996, the government deregulated Russia's financial markets in order to attract foreign money into the GKO bubble. However, this deregulation of financial markets took place in the worst possible moment, shortly before the outbreak of the Asia phase of the worldwide financial crisis. The ruble came under attack. The central bank had to spend most of its foreign exchange reserves and had to increase its, its interest rates again and again, and by this also pushed up GKO yields. Finally, in August 98, in spite of a $22 billion IMF rescue package, the whole, whole GKO bubble fell apart when Russia had to declare a debt moratorium. Now, let's look at the impact of these policies on the private households in Russia and of the health situation of Russian people. Between 1992 and 1996 alone, the real wages of Russian people fell by 52%, pensions by 45%. About half of employed people now receive wages at or below the subsistence minimum. But still, 
the truth is much worse because even these extremely low wages are in many cases not being paid due to the payment crisis of Russia's corporate sector. At the same time, the social protection system has fallen apart and health expenditures are extremely low. And this has now caused a comeback of many po uh, poverty-related diseases in Russia. As an example, cases of tuberculosis have more than doubled during the first five years of shock therapy. The dramatic decline of real income of private households has also caused an unprecedented depopulation process in Russia. The birth rate in Russia has fallen to only half of what is required to replace the present generations by their children. In its entire history, including during wartime, Russia has never experienced such a low birth rate. Furthermore, as a direct consequence of shock therapy, the mortality rate in Russia has sharply increased and is now among the highest in Europe. Life expectancies in all successor states of the Soviet Union have fallen below the level of 1981. In Russia, male life expectancies have fallen from 64 years in 1990 to 57 years now. The combined effect of these trends is that in the first six years of reforms, three million Russian people died prematurely and five million were not born. In this sense, the Russian reform of the 1990s claimed more victims than the mass famine in the early 1930s. As the leading Russian economist Sergei Glazyev has documented in his book Genocide, Russia and the New World Order, the effects of the economic disintegration on the Russian population are fulfilling the definition of genocide established by the UN International Convention. The convention identifies as an act of genocide the premeditated creation for any group of people of such conditions of life as are intended to cause the physical destruction of the group in whole or in part. According to Glazyev, the post-1992 genocide in Russia can indeed be compared to three other catastrophes in Russia. Napoleon's invasion, the civil war in, after 1917, and Hitler's aggression. When the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, it was widely touted as the victory of the free market system over communism. This was not actually the case, because at the same time that the Soviet Union was collapsing, the Western banking system was collapsing as well. Thanks to Richard Nixon taking the dollar off of gold in 1971, the high interest rate measures of Paul Volcker in 1979, and a series of banking deregulation and tax changes during the early 1980s, by the end of the 1980s, with the real estate bubble popping and the junk bond bubble popping, the United States banking system itself was bankrupt. Coming out of World War II, the United States was the most powerful nation in the world. And as such, it represented a strategic threat to the international oligarchs centered in the city of London. The United States was public enemy number one and had to be destroyed. In order to do this, they opened up a flank called the Cold War and helped build up Russia as a counterweight to the United States. But when the Soviet Union fell, the plans changed. As long as the Soviet Union represented a credible military threat, we had to keep some elements of the U.S. industrial cap capacity alive so that we could respond to that Soviet threat. But when the Soviet Union fell, then this, we were able to turn loose the parasites in our own economy and go after what remained of U.S. industry. It was, in fact, the fall of the Soviet Union that made the derivatives bubble possible. Now, to destroy the Soviet Union and its successor states, the oligarchy adopted an inside-outside strategy. 
From the outside, the International Monetary Fund, led by Harvard's Jeffrey Sachs and others. The issue of shock therapy to go in and destroy the Soviet system, to destroy the factories, to destroy the employment, to break down the very essence of society, work shortages, price hikes, things were unavailable. The whole system broke down. Now, the inside job of this Spencer movement was through the mafias. Into this chaos, the West deployed a lot of money to build up the Russian mafias, to build up organized crime, to dis help destroy Russia from within. We taught them to steal. We sent in the lawyers, the bankers, the accountants to teach the Russian mafia how to properly launder money. We helped extract tons and tons of raw materials. We helped flood the country with drugs. We helped, in short, destroy the entire Russian system. That way, the thinking was, Russia would not remain a strategic threat. Therefore, we could safely take down the U.S. economy. By 1995, organized crime in the black market accounted for 45% of the Russian economy. But at the same time that Russia was collapsing, the West was collapsing. During the 1980s, the so-called boom years, we took on several dollars in debt for every dollar's gain in GDP. And GDP itself is an inflated figure. By the late 1980s, the banking system was gone. We had the SNL crisis, the Texas banking system disintegrated. We had, in 1990, Citicorp was secretly taken over by the U.S. government. And in 1991, we had a series of big shotgun mergers among the big banks. Now, in 1987, Greenspan was brought in to build the bubble. Greenspan, whose background uh, includes part being part of the Ayn Rand cult and also a stint at J.P. Morgan, the two things which go together, decided to help launch the derivatives bubble. If you compare the growth of derivatives over the 1990s to the level of world trade in goods and the level of world gross world output or world GDP, you can see that there's no comparison. Derivatives have skyrocketed. World GDP itself is an inflated figure, but derivatives have run much higher than that. And meanwhile, in the United States, the real economy has dropped about 50%. The physical economy as measured per capita, per household, per square kilometer, by a market basket of production and consumption of physical goods, a 50% drop while everything, all the money numbers have gone sky high. Look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is no, it's no longer industrial. It doesn't really represent anything except a perception index. But look at how the Dow has grown since the Berlin Wall fell, since we were able to turn the parasites loose on the U.S. economy. Now, U.S. companies, they don't produce products anymore. They produce a stock price. They produce debt. They produce all sorts of paper, which then, then be speculated on and thrown into the derivatives bubble. And that's, that's what the Dow Jones represents. Another way to look at it is to look at the way that the information society, the information age companies have taken over. America Online, which is an online service, an internet service, has a larger market capitalization, the value of all of its stock, than Ford and General Motors put together. And Yahoo, the search engine, is as big as General Motors. And it's even worse if you look at the steel industry. eBay, the online flea market is worth more than all of the U.S. steel companies combined. This is insane. We have an economy which doesn't produce anymore. It's all paper. And this paper is crumbling. We're in the midst of the biggest bubble in history breaking apart. Which ironically brings us right back to Russia. Having destroyed the Russian economy, Russia can no longer pay its debts. In the fall of 1998, Russia defaulted on its debts and sent the global financial system into panic. There were billions of dollars worth of losses on bad derivatives bets and other things in Russia. 
and there was a general fear that the political control of the system was breaking down. And what's keeping the system alive at this point is merely political control. And when that breaks down, or when the physical economy completely breaks down, then the bubble is going to go. Now, to deal with this crisis, the Fed and the other central banks in the West pumped in billions of dollars worth of cash into the bubble. This, of course, temporarily saved the day. They bailed out long-term capital management. But it didn't solve the problem. They became locked into a pattern of widespread market manipulations. This summer, they had to run another type of bailout to save the giant Tiger hedge fund and other hedge funds that were involved in the yen carry trade. And right now, as we speak, there's a yet another bailout operation going on to stop the banks who were involved, to protect the banks who were involved in the gold carry trade. So it's market manipulation after market manipulation. There's, there never was a free market. That's just a nice name for the oligarchic system. But they're having to manipulate it and intervene more and more all the time. Every time they plug one hole, they rip open a new hole, and the bubble gets bigger and bigger. We had a chance at the end of the 1970s to turn this system around to save the world economy and to save the world. And instead, we chose to go with Paul Volcker and his controlled disintegration. We had a chance in the late 1980s to save the system again, and we didn't. We chose to go with Alan Greenspan and his bubble. Now, Greenspan is going to go down as the stupidest banker in history, the architect of the worst bubble the world has ever known. But there's no need for the world, no need for us to go down with him. This time, let's get it right. In establishing a community of principle among nations of the world, including China, India, other Asian countries in particular, we have to recognize that European civilization, which essentially is a byproduct of the influence of Egypt on Greece and of certain revolutionary developments relative to Egypt, which occurred in Greece, that the cultural development of South Asia, East Asia, while it's mixed in modern times with European civilization, is distinct. And therefore, the question arises, what inherent common principles exist among nations of European civilization and that heritage, and those of Asia, for example. How can we bring the population of the world together, including those nations which are not directly products of European civilization, uh, which are the largest part of humanity, together with the United States and other nations of European heritage? to find common, deeper principles which will govern their relations one with the other. The way to understand this as Americans is to look at the question from the standpoint of the inside of the history of European civilization as such. I shan't go, of course, in this <laughs> occasion through everything, but I shall identify the most crucial things which bear directly upon the, what should be the basis for U.S. foreign and strategic doctrine today, to replace the garbage which is <laughs> overflowing in our State Department currently. All right, now, Greek civilization is unique. It emerged under the protection and influence of Egypt, Egyptian civilization, which is much older. Now, we have indications going back to the, the third millennium BC of a very advanced culture in Egypt, some, in some respects more advanced than those we know from a later period. But the Egyptians contributed a foundation as friends and sponsors 
of the greater Greek, what became the greater Greek culture, which was very important to the Greeks, as was emphasized, for example, by Plato in his dialogues, especially the, the Critias, the Timaeus, and others. But the Greeks made, in that context, a unique contribution to all civilization. That unique contribution is the basis for what became European civilization. So in that sense, when we speak of European civilization in terms of its characteristic features, we're talking about something that began in Greece and with Greece, although with a certain assistance in the birth from Egypt. The distinction of Greek civilization is the discovery of the principle of the idea. And just think about this for a moment, and we'll, then we'll situate where Christianity comes into this in defining modern European civilization. If you look at the oldest known writings of the Greeks, the Homeric epics, for example, you have a picture of primarily of man as like an animal, a plaything of these pagan gods of Olympus, with the exception of a curious figure called the goddess Athena, who sometimes intervened in these things. This is the Greece of the Iliad, the Greek Greece of the Odyssey. Then we come to a later period, after a great reform by Solon of Athens, who founded the first republic in all known history in his reform at Athens. And his famous poem, which is sometimes referred to as the Constitution, was for the founders of the United States a crucial point of inspiration in defining our Declaration of Independence, our conception of our republic in general, and our Constitution. Then you have a later period, the Golden Age as such, the so-called Age of Pericles, which is the age of a number of developments. The age of Aeschylus, the great tragedian, the age of Sophocles, another great tragedian. And also in sculpture, the work of the famous Scopus and the work of Praxiteles. Now these sculptors did something relatively unique for that period of history and the preceding thousands of years. If you look at ancient Greek art, sculpture, and ancient Egyptian sculpture from that period and from about a thousand years earlier, you find it's what we call archaic. It's flat, it's tombstone art. There is no life in it. The, the statues are assembled on the basis of a triangular base to be solid in the sense that a student of simple Euclidean geometry would think of a solid figure, stably based. But the, the great figures of Greek sculpture are not solidly based like that. They're a little bit off balance. But if you look at them closely, they are not really off balance. They represent a figure, a face, or a whole figure caught in mid-motion. And the mind looking at these figures finds something very special about them, which the Romans later could never quite capture is that the mind senses and recognizes from the what seems to be the off-balance characteristic of the statue or the sculpted head, sees in that a body in mid-motion, expressing something, not dead, alive. This is the way we represent ideas in stone. As something fixed, something carved, in mid-motion, huh? cut in stone, which suggests to the onlooker something wonderful, an idea. You'll find the same thing, to skip ahead, and go back to about 1498, AD 1498. Go to Milan and go into a famous chapel there, which has been recently rehabilitated, which you'll find the portrait by Leonardo da Vinci of the Last Supper. Now, this is a wonderful experience. You got, go into this room, this chapel-shaped room, and you see the portrayal of the Last Supper on the wall. It's a flat wall. 
but you see a room in depth. You move in this, in the room, facing the stack, facing the painting, and the painting seems to move with you, just as it would move if you were in an actual room, looking into the room, and from different angles, different points. And above all, the eye of Christ, which is in the center of the painting, follows you directly wherever you go within that chapel. This is the same principle that Scopus and Praxiteles mastered in respect to Greek classical Greek sculpture expressed as painting. The great paintings of Leonardo da Vinci and his immediate follower, Raphael Sanzio, express the same principle of composition. This is the great contribution of European civilization, is to make conscious, not only in stone, but also in painting, in poetry, in drama, particularly in the great tragedies, the notion of ideas. The same notion of ideas was elaborated greatly by Plato in his, directly in his dialogues. And Plato's conception of truth and truthfulness in opposition to the contemporary degenerate notions of law of our Supreme Court under Rehnquist and Scalia. These were also ideas, the notions of scientific principle, universal scientific principle, which can be discovered by the mind and which can be demonstrated to be universally true in empirical or experimental practice. These are ideas. These are products of the cognitive powers of the individual human mind, powers which no animal has. We make a distinction in knowledge, in the theory of knowledge, and in politics, between learning as we may teach an animal to learn, or a chimpanzee may teach itself to learn. A chimpanzee will never discover an idea, not a true idea. They will discover a technique. They will discover a useful technique, but they will never discover a universal principle. Only a human being, the individual mind, can discover a principle. Now, come along a bit to <clears throat> later in history. The, as a result of the victory of Alexander the Great in destroying the evil Persian Empire, which was a continuation of the even more evil Babylonian culture before then, there was a revolution in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is called, became called Hellenistic culture. And Hellenistic culture, with all its drawbacks and internal faults and difficulties, was the highest level of culture which European civilization reached, essentially, until about the 15th century, until modern times. Then in about 200 BC, about the time that the Roman soldiers murdered the great Archimedes at Syracuse, the Romans, which in the process of becoming the later Roman Empire, placed an increasingly dominant role in the Mediterranean. The level of culture of European civilization collapsed. The Greek classical tradition was crushed under the brutish heel of Roman and Roman imperial culture, Latin culture. It took a long time for mankind to recover the level of civilization to that which had existed in the Hellenistic period the period of Aristophanes, the greatest scientist of Egypt, who was also a Greek. Every development in European civilization upward since that time has been based on two things. First of all, the Hellenistic or Greek culture, which was still widespread, though subordinated, in the Middle East, was the culture of the apostles in the time of Christ. The, there was no Hebrew language spoken at that time. There was a Hebrew written script, but how to pronounce it, what it meant, was somewhat in doubt. You had a, an Arabic language, Aramaic, which is the predecessor of some of the languages of that area today, and you had Greek. And the cultivated, educated people of that area, including some of Christ's apostles, as you may note, thought and wrote in classical Greek, the classical Greek of Plato. 
Exemplary is the case of the Apostle John. Also exemplary is the case of the Apostle Paul with his epistles. So these, these ideas of the classical Greeks became the foundation upon which Christianity spread its message. The essential contribution of Christianity to this revival of civilization was the principle of Christ that all persons are made equally, man and woman, in the image of the creator of the universe. And therefore it followed that the acceptable order of society to the Christian was a form of society in which the general welfare was defended and promoted in the sense I've described the general welfare earlier. There was a long struggle to bring this kind of society into being, not because there was any particular plan to build a form of state, but rather there was a commitment to establish relations among people which were consistent with this Christian principle as the Christian principle made use of Greek culture as a way of propagating its message. The result was eventually the emergence of the first modern nation state or the first paradigm of a modern nation state in the 15th century in Europe centered around what is called the Golden Renaissance. This led to, eventually, to the formation of the modern nation state. However, for various reasons, only one nation state ever achieved a durable constitutional form consistent with Christian principle, and that was the United States. This is no accident. What had happened is in the attempt to found a modern nation state, as in France, in the, and in England under Henry the Sec and the Seventh, uh, and in uh, with, by Isabella in Spain, these efforts were crushed by a financier oligarchy based in Venice. Venice, in order to try to prevent European nation states from developing a long according to the modern model, organized religious wars within Europe. And Europe was torn, as I described earlier, by religious wars up until 1648, and a little bit thereafter, but the century then. So as a result of these conditions, no durable form of nation-state republic, constitutional nation-state republic, was ever developed in Europe to the present date. We have a noble experiment in the case of Charles de Gaulle's efforts in the Fifth Republic in France, but as we know, that was destroyed by his successors. Only the United States Constitution represents to this day a form of nation-state republic, which in its constitution, in its original conception, in its underlying law, and in our best traditions, is consistent with the Christian principle underlying the efforts to form the nation-state during the 15th century. This is not accidental in the sense that we did not create a nation-state on our frontiers. We were not people who took our circumstances and responded to our circumstances and developed a form of society uh, based on these circumstances, not at all. All of the ideas on which the United States was premised and developed came from Europe directly, including a strong influence directly from Gottfried Leibniz, whose writings were the, among the most important influences on the United States during the course of the 18th century. The most important influence in shaping the, what became the Declaration of Independence and our federal constitution, especially its preamble. So that from the standpoint of Europeans, the United States was their treasure. It was established with the help of Europeans, with the inspiration and backing of Europeans, in order to create in our nation a republic which would serve as a model and rallying point for the creation of similar republics, sovereign republics, throughout the world, especially in Europe. That is our special, exceptional quality as a nation, a quality we have often betrayed. This is the secret of the power of the United States, not as physical power, but the power to influence the world, the power to provide certain contributions to development of a community of principle globally. Now, these principles 
to, in order to be effective, to be accepted in China, to be accepted in India and elsewhere, must be understood in their universal aspect. From the beginning of Christianity, this was understood. You have the writing of that great Jewish writer, Philo of Alexandria, who expressed this confidence in what we call an ecumenical principle. That there are certain principles which are common to certain forms of religious belief. The Judaism of Philo, for example, or Christianity, or its currents in Islam. These monotheistic currents, which understand there are universal principles underlying human existence, underlying the universe as a unity, and that we must find in each religious current, we must find our, our atonement with those universal principles. Uh, a more recent example of this came in the 18th century with the great Moses Mendelssohn, who also expressed the same principle. Moses Mendelssohn was an Orthodox Jew who made a revolution which resulted to a large degree. He was a chief contributor to the emergence of modern German culture, together with his friend Lessing. He also was ecumenical. He remained an Orthodox Jew to the day his death, devoted and explained that, but he was ecumenical. Similarly, in the 15th century, one of the great founders of modern civilization, Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa wrote a paper to Pace Fide expressing the same principle. So our view as representing a civilization, European civilization, which is Christian and classical Greek in its origin, is a ecumenical view of mankind as a whole. We hold it to be true that all men are created equal that all parts of humanity are united by underlying principles which may have to be discovered, but which nonetheless exist. The nature of human beings in all parts of this planet is the same. Some people degenerate from that standard, but we call them degenerates. Yeah? But generally, every human being, every baby born is good, because every baby born has this cognitive power for discovering truth, for discovering principles, for contributing to the improvement of the human condition. It's their natural quality. And the function of society is to bring this forth and nurture it. Man is not inherently evil. Man is inherently good. But as Christianity teaches, man often errs and must be redeemed. Thus, our concern as a secular society must be to respect this principle to understand how important the nation state is in providing the only form of society in which there is true equality, in which every individual human being is respected and defended as being made equally in the image of the creator of the universe and must be so respected, so treated, so nurtured, so educated, not the way we're educating them today, destroying our own children with our rotten education system. That is the basis for foreign policy. We find, in looking abroad, as I have, uh, had some familiarity with the history, the cultural history of India, its Sanskrit and ba Vedic background. I've had some acquaintance with China, certain aspects of it. I've been otherwise in educated on this subject by others. And we find that in China, as in the teachings of what we call Confucius and Mencius, there is in ancient China the same kind of tradition which we honor in terms of principle in our own society. We find in India the same thing. Therefore, the approach we must take is an ecumenical approach. We must understand that all human beings, from whatever their backgrounds are, have the same potential for goodness. Our job is to bring that forth, to encourage people to be as good as they are born to be, to be redeemed, to redeem the nations, and to build a form of community of nation states on this planet which shares that commitment, which understands one another in terms of this, these common principles, as Philo of Alexandria attempted to express this. As the, as the Christians, especially John and Paul, 
emphasize this. As a great theologian, Christian theologians like Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa expressed this in De Pace Fide. As we have always understood it, the best of us in the United States, and as Mencius and uh, Confucius before him and others have also understood this, we must bring this forth. That should be the foreign policy of the United States. Our, our foreign policy and our strategic policy should not be who do we kill tomorrow, who is our enemy that we must fight. War is not the natural condition of mankind. It's an errant condition of mankind, produced by defective cultures, especially by the kind of oligarchical culture which treats some people as animals. For example, let's take our educational system. Let's do that. What does our educational system do today? Let's compare it with my childhood and youth. Well, I can tell you frankly, it was bad then, relative to what it had been in other countries and our own countries earlier. We had a problem that not too many people were educated properly, but those who had a proper education had a better one in the 19th century, the late 19th century especially, than we had in the 20th century. And those who went to schools in the 1920s and 1930s had, so they had less education, had a better education than we do today in our schools. Education has degenerated over the course of the late 1940s, 1950s and on. We give people more education, but it gets worse and worse as we produce, as we mass produce it. Mm -hmm. So therefore we have undermined our people. We, are, we don't teach history anymore. What person knows in school today about ancient Egypt? What person in school today knows what was Egyptian culture in its high point in the middle of the third millennium BC? Who knows in school today what the change in the conception of man and man's relationship to nature was in the period from the Homeric epochs through the Golden Age, through Plato? Who knows what the, what the significance of Christian civilization is? Who knows what the degeneracy of the Latin Roman culture was and its terrible effects on us to this present day? Who knows what's wrong with our science education today? What's specifically rotten in it, the way it's taught? Who knows these things? We educate our children not to be thinkers, not to be citizens, but to be cattle, to be human cattle. You are going to become a cow. In this school, we will teach you how to become and think like a cow and be happy about being like a cow. If you don't agree with us, we'll stuff you with Ritalin. That's our educational system today. We don't teach history anymore. We don't teach science anymore. We teach information, which is merely a confusion, a scattering of this and that. So therefore, we have to rebuild our society, but I think, and history teaches us, the best way to rebuild a society, to rebuild this stinking education system which we impose upon our children today, to clean up that stinking entertainment which we call television today, and similar things, we have to have a sense of mission. And the mission now is, faced with the worst financial crisis in all world history, faced with the danger of new kinds of warfare, faced with the danger of a planet collapsing into a new dark age, we have to adopt as a sense of mission the determination that these things shall not happen. That we are going to mobilize our population and bring together the people of goodwill from around the world for a common purpose. The common purpose is to develop man and to build a community of principle among sovereign nation states, which will attack these problems as collaborators. In that, in that work, typified by our need to accelerate our exploration of space, we as a nation and we as nations must adopt a sense of mission we have to explore this universe. 
Do you know some of the terrible things that have happened to this planet in the past thousands of years? Do you know what happened when the glaciers went into their fast phase of melt? Do you know what happened to this planet about 12,000 years ago? When the glaciers were at their peak rate of melting? Did you know that whole civilizations were wiped out as the levels of the seas rose by 300 to 400 feet to the level, today's level, above which they had been earlier? Do you know the terrible things of, of meteorites and so forth have brought upon this planet? Do you know how vulnerable we are on this planet Earth because we have not yet been able to reach out and control some of the forces in the solar system and beyond? which might imperil the very existence of humanity in times to come, we have to get out into space. We have to understand the principles which operate there. We have to learn to control our environment, the environment of the solar system, as well as the environment of planet Earth. So therefore, in fighting against poverty, in fighting against war, in fighting against the threat to destruction of humanity in the future, we must adopt a sense of mission, a national mission. In a larger sense, the same sense of mission that President Kennedy tried to provoke with his proposal, highly successful, remember, for a manned moon landing within the decade. It worked. I think that with that example, we can say it would work again. This time, not just a man moon landing, but beyond. And let's bring this planet into order at last. Let us build what John Quincy Adams envisaged as a global community of principle. And let's build it now before it's too late. Now you've heard what Lyndon LaRouche who today is a declared candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination, has had to say. And I imagine that you might ask, well, what do our leaders in Washington think about this? What does our government think about this? Do they know what Mr. LaRouche is saying? What's their assessment? Well, I can tell you that what Mr. LaRouche has presented to you today has been presented many times to members of the Congress, both in the U.S. House of Representatives and in the Senate. It's been presented to leading layers of every relevant department of the federal government, and it's been presented to President Clinton himself through members of his staff. In the Congress, there's very little positive that I can say. Oh, there are some good people in the United States Congress, but for the most part, as the world saw during the disgusting spectacle that was known as the impeachment of Bill Clinton, the Congress itself is dominated, it's ruled, by a bunch of incompetent Neanderthals, by ideologues. As for the Clinton administration itself, the problem is a different one. 
First, keep in mind that many members of Bill Clinton's administration, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, Defense Secretary Bill Cohn, and indeed Clinton's own Vice President Al Gore, act on policies on a daily basis that are in direct opposition, direct disagreement with the explicitly stated policies of the President. Bill Clinton knows that Lyndon LaRouche is right on the crucial points that you've just heard. And particularly on fundamental questions, Bill Clinton is in agreement with Lyndon LaRouche. But he's afraid to act. He's afraid to move against what are admittedly powerful forces. He's afraid that the American people won't understand, that they won't support him. So what we've witnessed repeatedly is the president himself taking steps, weak steps, in a positive direction, or directing members of his administration, people who he trusts, people like Strobe Talbot, for instance, as well as others, to take what are weak steps in a positive direction. But he repeatedly does so without laying out the full truth. President Clinton does not, he will not, for instance, say that it is the British that are out to break up Russia and are behind the destabilization in the Caucasus region. Just say straight out that the U.S. policy is to oppose this destabilization, but that a pack of British agents allied with people like Zbigniew Brzezinski, his protege, Madeleine Albright, and George Bush are pushing the British policy of busting up Russia via destabilization operations in the Caucasus in Central Asia and elsewhere, but that the United States is opposed to this policy. And it's the failure to do precisely this that repeatedly results in this administration, despite its usually benign intentions and motives, to find itself in the midst of disaster. It is, ladies and gentlemen, fundamentally a crisis of leadership. It is Bill Clinton's problem, but it's your problem too. Because today, in the midst of this situation, in the midst of what is probably the worst crisis that our nation has ever faced, you have to change. You must provide Lyndon LaRouche with a mandate by which a LaRouche-formulated alternative can and will be adopted. Thank you.
So why don't you give up the idea that everything has to be simple, everything has to be stupid, everything has to be in bite-sized answers, and let's talk about it, and let's think.